Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special occasion. Uh, we're coming to the end of two fascinating days of the third comics conference, and we're here to celebrate a bumper crop of new books in comic studies, key terms in comic studies, seeing comics through art history, art history for comics, and graphic medicine. My name is Manon Parry. I'm professor of the history of medicine at the VU and also based at the University of Amsterdam. And the authors of all of these books are here tonight, along with copies of the books for you to browse. And there's flyers on the front if you want to take a closer look. And the strategy for introducing you to these new publications today will be that our speakers are going to introduce each other's books. So there'll be no self-promotion, but friendly co-promotion. And we'll have plenty of time at the end of the presentations for questions, uh, but also there'll be drinks afterwards to celebrate. So I hope you'll stick around and you can talk more with uh, the authors then and the editors. So shall I begin with the first? Everyone's ready? So our first book is Key Terms in Comic Studies, which was edited by Erin LaCour. If you raise your hand, thanks. Who's an assistant professor of English literature and visual culture at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Uh, Simon Grennan, co-author, leading researcher at the University of Chester and a graphic novelist. And Rick Spaniers, lecturer at the Media and Culture Department of the University of Amsterdam. And the book will be introduced by Ian Horton. Raise your hand. Who <laughs> is, it's like school, sorry. Who's a reader in graphic communication. <laughs> Very strict, I didn't know that about myself. But <laughs> a reader in graphic communication at the London School of Communication. And Maggie Gray, yeah. who is senior lecturer in critical and historical studies at Kingston University. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to start off, and I, I know it's a bit difficult to see, but if we look at the cover of the book, um, then it's got a picture of um, several dogs piled up on top of each other. Some people say that you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> but maybe in this case we can judge this book by its cover. All of those dogs are different sizes um, and they're different breeds. So is the book about hybridity? Is it about crossbreeding in some kind of a way? Or is it about definitions, both small and large definitions of key terms in comics? Or is it just piling up definition after definition with no real aim or plot? <laughs> Thankfully, the person who designed the cover is with us, and maybe in the Q&A, Simon will tell us what it's all about. <laughs> I've really only got one complaint about this book. I wish the book had been published much, much earlier, because at the time, I was working on the two other books that are going to be introduced in a minute, and unfortunately, when this book came out, I had to go back through and use the definitions that they provided to rewrite sections of my own book. So if only you could have been a year or two earlier, but I guess you had quite a lot to organise and sort out. Um, some of those terms were interesting because I didn't expect them. So one of those terms that they used was the term of iconography, which is quite a rare term in comic studies, and I was thinking, well, that's unusual. Um, so why is this here? I probably disagreed a little bit with the way the interpretation was done, but at least it gave me a basis to work on and also an idea that iconography was actually of value and being interesting at this point in time. Um, some of the other terms that I was interested in were um, semiotics and its relationship to style. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the way that the different terms link to each other later on in the talk. Uh, and then the final thing I wanted to say is I wish it had happened a lot earlier because I did use their definitions of different um, schools of Franco-Belgian comics. Um, I spent hours, days even, trawling through lots and lots of different books to build these definitions. And there they were in this book, <laughs> simply and directly presented with all of the references that I'd found with all my own hard work. So thank you, Simon and Eric <laughs> and Rick. It was a bit late. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think just to echo that, when we, um, I found it really, really helpful for sort of checking in um, with some of the terms that I'd been using, some of which are quite kind of comic study specific, um, like applied comics, but others kind of crossed over and are used in both comic studies and in art history, um, like the avant-garde. So it was a very helpful um, in terms of just kind of checking my thinking. Um, and I think the one that I really found the most um, useful in that sense actually was Aaron's um, on abstraction, um, particularly because it kind of didn't just sort of summarise the shape of um, thinking on that term um, that had happened in comic studies in the past, but also sort of mapped the trajectory um, and the direction that um, comic studies was going in, um, in terms of thinking about that area. So yeah, having been kind of immersed um, in quite a lot of the quite complicated literature on abstraction in comic studies um, that comes from many different kind of disciplinary perspectives, um, it was just really super helpful to kind of have that um, very, very succinct um, but kind of comprehensive um, definition of that term to kind of check my own kind of thinking and what I was um, trying to say in a lot more words. And as someone who, um, and Ian knows this, regularly just blows holes in word counts, <laughs> I think that was one of the most impressive things about this book, is how um, the contributors managed to um, give these kind of very insightful, comprehensive um, entries on these terms in just, you know, around 250 words, which is like so, so impressive, uh, particularly to me. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the book is really impressive from a kind of writer's point of view in terms of how the contributors um, took these, these big kind of terms, did that kind of research, that gathering process, and then that sort of distilling um, and condensing process. But I think also from an editorial um, point of view, it's an incredibly impressive the amount of wrangling that I imagine was involved. Um, the fact that you kind of brought together so like nearly a hundred contributors um, and all these kind of contributions and kind of yeah, made that work. Um, I think from an editor's point of view, I, that's also very, very um, impressive as well. And particularly the, the diverse range of disciplinary backgrounds um, that you brought together in terms of that sort of community of comic scholars, which, um, as we know, is one of the strengths of comic studies, that it has this um, interdisciplinarity, this it's a very kind of varied field, which makes it really exciting. Um, but I also think this book is, is really useful in consolidating the field and it feels like um, one of the aims was to to kind of create a resource that you know that stops us talking past each other um, and allows us to kind of talk with each other and to understand um, and grasp the lexicon that, that we're using um, so that I think is yeah the major kind of contribution that this um, this work makes and I think yeah the other thing I think it does is it, it prevents what used to happen quite a bit where people might rock up in a journal and be like, no one's ever spoken about this in comic studies before, or more often, no one's ever spoken about this in relation to comics before, and it's like, well, mm, no. <laughs> so they have, um, and here's a way of kind of finding the key resources, finding the key examples that then allows you to position yourself. So as Ian was saying, like um, some entries, I didn't quite agree with the, the take, um, but it then meant I had to kind of explain why in my own writing. And I think that's really, really valuable. Yeah, the last thing I want to talk about is the navigation of the book, um, which you can look at um, once we finish these talks. You can come and look at the book and actually experience it. So right, each entry, um, when it occurs in other definitions throughout the book, is then capitalised so that you can see which are the key terms when you're going through the book, and it gives you different pathways. So you can find different routes through the book. Um, most people seem to quite like this, and it has been described, I think, by Garth Brooks um, in a forthcoming review as a bit like a build-your-own-adventure kind of a game, that you navigate through it in some way. Um, other people say maybe it's problematic because the capitalisation actually breaks the sentences up and makes it a bit more difficult to read. So that's an interesting kind of thing. And you can make your own minds up when you have a look at the book afterwards. 
the last thing to say. I think we had some questions. <laughs> we wanted to abuse our position, it'd be the first people to speak, that we had some questions we'd just really like to hear um, in the kind of Q&A part, I guess. But I think that this kind of book is never going to please everyone because everyone will always be like, why is this not included? Um, or why was this included? So I think, yeah, I would love to hear more about the process of um, selection and developing the sort of criteria for selection that you went through as editors. Um, and if there's anything that you think second edition will definitely get that in there. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll leave it for later, but uh, I have to say, I always like a good feisty debate about uh, an academic text. So it sounds like there's lots to talk about and also a really useful book to begin with this evening because it's clearly a great introduction for people who are coming to the field new, but also an opportunity to get everybody on the same page, so to speak, who is talking together. Thank you. All right, our second and third books are Art History for Comics, Past, Present and Potential Futures, written by Ian Horton and Maggie Gray and Seeing Comics Through Art History, Alternative Approaches to the Form, edited by Ian Horton and Maggie Gray as well. And they are going to be introduced by Rick Spaniers. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to jump right in, if that's OK. Art history has always been the most neglectful parent of comic studies. Literally, uh, literary, uh, cultural memory and media studies, while also away quite often, are at least present on holidays, um, if only to shower comic studies with some gifts. These gifts can never substitute actual present parenting, but they are gifts nonetheless. And it's always better as child, children, you know, it's better to get gifts than not to get gifts. Um, but such gifts can never really substitute actual uh, uh, parenting, um, so right, something more might be no uh, needed. From these brief moments of attention, from these gifts, comic scholars have built enclaves in academic departments around the globe. Art history, however, never came out of its Eames lounge chair, including Hawker, of course, um, and never once looked out from the beautiful yet somewhat uh, vacuous, vacuous coffee book that it always seems to be browsing. Um, being the neglected child, my relationship to art history is characterized by a sort of acting out. Uh, on some days, I seek its attentions by attempting to write and think according to its rules, uh, a little too slavishly. And on other days, I just want to watch it and its ivory tower and an Eames chair um, including Hawker, again, burn. Maybe I was vaguely aware that I was being childish before, but after having read Maggie Gray and Ian Haig's Art History for Comics, I became sure of it. Uh, oh, sorry, Ian Horton, I'm sorry. I'm always afraid that that happens. <laughs> uh, instead of acting out against the neglect of art history for comic studies, um, Gray and Horton have chosen to selflessly build an established connection between art history and comic studies that spans, as the subtitle boasts, past, present, and possible futures. If we build it, they seem to have thought, he, and in my mind, art history is still a he, he will come. In doing so, the authors do not only frame, as I did, the relationship between art history and comic studies as a form of neglect, but as a chance for comic studies to broaden and strengthen its theoretical horizons. Reframed as such, the field of art history becomes a treasure trove of a bookcase from which the children still present in the house can rate the most promising and exciting approaches for their use. The adventure that follows, and in that ev ev uh, uh, adventure, Gray and Horton make good on their promise. As they go through the absentee father's bookcase to find moments when comic studies brushes up against art history, um, they show readers that there's a veritable wealth of connections already established, which was, I think, the most surprising to me. And there's much, much more to learn from further cross-pollination. The book's scope, to be honest, is quite staggering. I think you've been doing a little bit too much. <laughs> It does something that is becoming somewhat old-fashioned. That is, there are actually three books in here. A re-evaluation of the discipline's history, a theoretical handbook for contemporary co comic studies, and a manifesto for a better future. Any sane academic would publish these books separately, thereby banking not on one, but three publications. 
Um, Ian and Maggie, however, have chosen to put them together into one incredibly wealthy volume. To put it in Dutch terms, you're not only getting a discount voucher, but there's also a three-for-one deal going on here. <laughs> a little more seriously now, um, in downcast eyes, the denigration of vision in 20th century French thought, the famous, famous intellectual historian Martin Jay chronicles the iconophobia of much 20th century academic thought. It is this fear of the image that has made comics stand out as an anomaly in this paradigm, um, prompting literary and cultural studies scholars to challenge existing preconceptions concerning to textuality and materiality through reading comics. With art history for comic studies, we now have a book that instead of approaching comics as an anomaly but within the paradigm uh, that is always somewhat fearful of it, um, instead of that, it takes a disciplinary background that comics um, are much more welcome to in a certain way and really approaches them from their visuality. Art history for comic studies then does really deliver on, the promise, on, it, on its promise to balance out the theoretical underpinnings of comic studies and hopefully will allow scholars from around the globe to see comics instead of really reading them. More importantly even, by once and for all re-establishing re the manifold connections between art history and comic studies, Ian Horton and Mary Gray, uh, Maggie Gray force art history, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> force art history to start paying attention not by acting out, but by leading the way. And if that doesn't get the old man out of its Eames lounge chair, I suggest we rob him blind and leave him to rot. But just when you thought they'd done it all, um, I mean, at least for a year, uh, they worked very hard. Uh, Ian and Maggie teamed up again to compile and edit Seeing Comics Through Art History, the second book that they're presenting here today, which, in addition to their opening chapter, includes 18 more perspectives on art history and comics, from researchers who are also educators, artists, designers, curators, producers, libra librarians, editors, writers, and many more combinations of these. With topics ranging from old school art history to perception, reception, and meaning to new and newer art histories and possible future adjacements. Seeing comics through art history explores, through a range of methodologies, the diversity of approaches within art history for the, stu for the study of comics. It was really cool of you to do both. Thank you for that. So it's definitely a book that's going to be really helpful for me, and I really look forward also to question you on some of the choices that you've made. Okay, we'll move swiftly on so we can get to that Q&A soon then. So the final book to be presented now is Graphic Medicine, edited by Erin LaCour and Anna Paletti, who is Associate Professor of English Language and Culture at Utrecht University. And this will be introduced by Simon Grennan. Thank you. Hi, folks. Do you, can you hear me without the microphone? Oh. Yeah, good, because I... Yeah. Maybe for the live feed. Oh, the live feed. The people on the internet. Is this on now? Yes, it is. Oh, dear. The people on the internet. What a strange place. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you. Uh, so um, I'm going to introduce Graphic Medicine, uh, edited by uh, Erin uh, and Anna. Uh, and the book uh, also has contribu contributions, chapters, uh, by 11 other contributors. I'm going to read them out, uh, because actually you might know some of them, and also one of them is here. So well, the first is John Myers, who's sitting over there. Uh, Jared Gardner, who's in the US. Uh, Nancy K. Miller, Joanne Purcell and Simon Purcell Arand Mar, Susan Squire. Safta Ahmed, Julia Watson, Susie Becker, Crystal uh, Yin Lee, uh, Kaina Brillenberg Wirth. Is that right, Wirth? Wirth. Wirth. Oh, is it a, oh, is it a W? Oh, dear, my pronunciation is terrible. I speak English only and not very well. Um, <laughs> since, uh, since Ian Williams' 2007 coining of the term graphic medicine, uh, which I'm now going to call uh, rather confusingly GM, uh, it's genetically modified, uh, graphic Medicine, the book notes the proliferation of GM's practices, encompassing autobiographic and biographic representations of experiences of illness and care, strategies for public health, concepts and experiences of pathology, pedagogy, training, embodiment, and orientation to the quasi-industrial complex of global institutional medicine. Perhaps most significantly, the book focuses on those experiences where these areas over, overlap, coincide, or collide. Uh, 
The book achieves its aim. It's a good book. I recommend it. And we have a voucher for getting a free, a free uh, no, a discount voucher. Is that right? Isn't it? The book achieves its aim. It's a great book uh, of providing an in-depth exploration of how illness and disability, as well as healthcare systems and statistics, can make one feel. To explore and expose the subjective experiences of health and healthcare systems that may be difficult for both practitioners and patients to understand or explain in either verbal or visual languages alone. Of course, media specificity doesn't account for the extraordinary reach of the representations and stories considered in this book, or the myriad experiences of readers of this book. Rather, the book charts the influence of GM practices of the on GM practices of life writing, drawing, and publishing, raising the concomitant spectres of subject, identity, and agency, healthy and unhealthy power, and profound body transformations. We learn about isolation, marginalization, and self-awareness from Brillenberg Worth. Worth? Worth? Excellent. Themes that are, uh, you don't, seeing as I don't read by, I don't, while I'm reading, I don't pronounce the words, hence I've not pronounced Worth before. Uh, Brillenburg Worth. Uh, themes that are opened in the editor's introduction and in chapters by Gardner and Miller. Vulnerability thematizes the very different commentaries, methods, and experiences of Ahmed and Myers, whereas concepts of other, other and othered abilities and disabilities bring together the chapters by Lacour. Uh, Squire Purcell and Purcell Rand Marr. Although processes and ideas of healing are a constant threnody throughout the book, uh, Yin Li's chapter places memory and personal trauma at the center of stories of political violence. Finally, Becker and Watson consider scrutiny, self-scrutiny, and dissent in Watson's chapter, Revenge, as activities stealing back agency and creating identity or recreating identity contra unhealthiness often through narrative drawing itself. So I heartily recommend the book. It's, uh, it's incredibly rich and broad in its scope, and I think I might have mentioned the discount code already. <laughs> Thank you to everybody for those introductions. Are we going to allow you guys to get the first questions to get us rolling? <laughs> Do you want to give us a reminder? So, yeah, I mean, we just wanted to know about the process of, um, from the editor's point of view, I guess, of like kind of crafting something that's this complex. Um, and particularly, yeah, was there anything that, um, I don't know, yeah, what was the process of like deciding the selection criteria for entries? Um, and is there anything that you think now oh, we should have put that in? Uh, I hesitate to talk about our process. <laughs> Uh, because I, I haven't talked about this with Rick and Simon yet, so we don't have a, you know, a cohesive story. <laughs> Basically, we started by looking at a lot of different uh, compendiums of critical theory, of literary theory, media studies, and we started making lists from that. So we had, I mean, probably thousands of terms. And then we kind of went through and said, this isn't really relevant, or this is absolutely not relevant. These are too close. That was kind of the start. And then, of course, we started finding holes like, oh, there's not line or color or, you know, some of the things that are absolutely necessary for comic studies. Uh, and then we had a few issues, as I think you know, where we had overlaps, where we asked multiple people to write the definition of one term and then sometimes chose one, sometimes changed the term. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a very much a kind of in process uh, process. I'm very curious too about this, this idea that some of the terms were contested. Can you give us some insights into which ones they are? <laughs> no, I don't think <laughs> that's my head. I, I, I can't. Nobody dares. No. I, I, do you still remember one, Simon? Uh, contested terms. I think it was more a question, uh, if I remember rightly, that, uh, that folks... Uh, what, one of the things that happened alongside our, our kind of uh, trawl of, of the, the huge landfill of the, of the cross-disciplinary disciplinary terms um, was um, that we 
that we revived or recreated or made new, made new networks of scholars. I mean, there are 100 contributors to the book, including us. So that's 97 folks who we were in constant communication with. And what that meant was that we were mapping, one of the things that the book does almost incidentally, but as a byproduct, an important one, is that it marks a moment in time uh, where it describes a community of scholars. And the community of scholars are from loads of different disciplines and absolutely global and bring all sorts of different types of, of perspectives. And so really um, the, cont the contentions arose where folks suggested things that we should do that we hadn't thought of. And so, so, so we'd say, oh, such and such a term, yeah, this is on the list. Um, and we, we were very nuts and bolts about, very practical about how we managed uh, the list in terms of the scholars, the contributing scholars. And so we, we divided them up uh, into thirds. So, you know, I had 30 and Arian had 30 and Rick had 30. And so this, this started to, to reveal while we were communicating with the contributors that we were missing things or that ways in which we might have thought about a particular term. Actually, they, somebody would say, oh, you think that you're talking about this, but you're not. You're talking about that. And so we'd go, oh, uh, excellent, okay. And so we had folks adding to our list. That, uh, contributors would say, oh, yeah, no, this is great, but have you got this? Have you got that? Uh, and so, that, and so the, the, our list grew as well as changed. In fact, it grew more than it changed, I think, I think so. over, over time. And so we ended up with a, um, we ended up with a list where, the, where, where although we're, we are the, the, the cover editors of the book, there was co-editorial uh, with quite a large number of the contributors. Um, but I mean, in answer to the question, the slightly different answer to Erin's, is that, is that we've, um, revealing that you've not read the book as closely as you might, mm -hmm. um, the, is that the, 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 the rule by which we made a selection, there was a rule um, which doesn't describe the process that we went through, but it acted as a key benchmark for the three of us, and it's, it's in the book, so I'm going to read it to you. It's very short. I like a nice short rule, like uh, E equals MC squared. Uh, so our E equals MC squared reads, um, focused on Anglophone comic studies, so this is a book that is in the English language. This book compiles terms and critical concepts in current use, including those from other languages that have been adopted by and are currently applied in English. And so actually, this is a, this is a pretty useful, this was a pretty useful benchmark, and we spent months deciding what this benchmark should be. Uh, and, so that, and so that's it. So the, so the measure of current use is indexed by the number of global contributors in English, even though their first languages may not be English, and as comic scholars, they may be using other languages and coming from other disciplines and, and other places. And so that was, that, was the, that was the mark that we set ourselves. Uh, and that doesn't describe fully, in it, it really doesn't describe fully the, the editorial process, but that's the rock on which we, I think we, st we still found this is what this is about. It's about current use in comic scholarship, whatever that is, in comic studies rather, in English. That's the, yeah. Rick, do you want to? I just wanted to ask a question then about the navigation. So did you consider other options besides using the capitalization of the terms, which breaks up potentially for some readers the sentences? So did you consider any other way of doing that typographically? I mean, uh yeah, I think the sort of making the book as uh, uh, open as possible was, of course, one of the most important things of thinking of a key terms book such as this, um, uh, because it's not a book, of course, that you read from beginning to end, but you're really called to it in a sense. But we also wanted it to be or to allow a sort of browsing experience. Um, and so the capitalization was the way in which we um, devised of doing that. Um, and the fact that it is strong or maybe off-putting uh, in a sense. I think it's also part of what its purpose was in uh, the way in which the book works so that it's, um, because the entries are short anyway, I think we felt that we could trust people's uh, attention span to you know, go across 200 words uh, a, a little bit. And um, the sort of distraction of the capitalized terms was also uh, you know, supposed to be, you know, we're, we're, we, I think we've been very uh, platformy about it. So one of the goals was also to keep people reading and to sort of be distracted about a new term and think like, oh, wait, I've never seen a definition of that or, 
you know, how is that a definition in this book? And then sort of travel from one to the other side of the book and sort of not putting it down, but sort of spending more time in, in it than they initially sort of thought they would spend in it. So I think that's why, why we sort of went with that uh, choice of a more distracting typographical intervention. And that definitely happens. Like, I think you, you might go to it for a particular term and then suddenly you go down this rabbit hole and you're like, oh, and this one, and this one. And the mapping is really interesting because there's some connections that you would expect if we're thinking about kind of ecologies of, of comic studies. There's some things you expect, but then there's some connections that are um, unexpected. And that's yeah, really interesting for the reader to be like, oh, yeah, what is the relationship between that term and that term which don't necessarily fit or you wouldn't assume fit together or cross over. Um, yeah. yeah, just kind of on that point, I was reading the term caricature and I had no idea that you were going to really focus on the print technology side of that because that wasn't my natural kind of instinct to think, oh, this will be about print. But that's the way that person defined it, so that's fine. And then that took me into all of the different print areas, which was interesting. So I, I ended up reading about a load of stuff that actually was completely irrelevant to what I was doing. <laughs> and distracted me and stopped me from writing the books. But hey, it was still very interesting and valuable to see it through a new lens and one that would never have occurred to me. Can I ask one more question about... I should say about this. <laughs> that, that this method is not an original method. We nicked it from somewhere else. And so it, uh, it, it was, it's the method used in Prince's Dictionary of Narratology, which I think was published in 1989 or 1990. Uh, of which I'm a big fan. <laughs> now, I'm going to be strict chair again and say, is the question about one of the other books? Otherwise, you won't be allowed to ask it. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I wanted to ask uh, a question about the art history books, because as we all can see, there are two now, um, but uh, they're very close together in content. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the um, genealogy of these two books and how they came into being. And also both of them have a really interesting and beautiful cover image. Um, so I think, you know, as you get the chance later on, please check out these two cover images. But if there was a chance that it would have been one book, which cover image would you uh, ended up with? <laughs> No. Um, you particularly can't ask that question because one of the um, illustrators of the covers is, is in the room, which is John Myers. Um, do you want to talk about the genealogy of the books? Or shall I do it? My memory is terrible. Um, no, but I mean, it's interesting that you said that the art history um, for comics book was like three books because actually these originated as just one. So we um, first submitted a proposal um, to Palgrave for well, one book that was going to be a kind of hybrid of co-written book and co-edited book. So the past we were gonna write, the um, present was gonna be the kind of edited section, kind of mapping different approaches um, using art history in comic studies, and then we would write the future. Um, and quite reasonably, the anonymous reviewer said that was a really, really not great idea. <laughs> Um, and would have been a very confusing volume and not really satisfied anyone. Um, so then we kind of stepped back and said, well, why don't we do two? And to be honest, that seemed like enough. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's turned out much the better for it. Yeah. It's also worth saying that the, um, the series editor, um, Millie Davis, is it Millie Davis, Roger? Yeah, it is. Um, that she was very helpful in that process of how to split what we proposed as one book and she was very helpful and supportive in thinking well how can you take this forward because the reviewer it must be said the reviewers were very good at saying this is a problem they weren't particularly helpful in saying this is the answer to the problem um, so Millie really yeah, worked with us and allowed us to find a way to make these things happen um, and that was really good so it's, it's worth acknowledging that side of Palgrave as well that um, she's a very supportive editor and very, very helpful. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question to Erin and Anna before we open it up to the room. I'm just wondering, with so many of these books coming out, if you can reflect on what's happening with this. There seems to be an explosion of great new work. What, what is this about? What's supporting it and what does it represent? I think it would be interesting to hear from you as an outsider, yeah, actually. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. After me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know why 
everything seems to be happening all at once. I think part of that is due to our dear friend Roger Sabin over there. Maybe you can speak to the series a little bit. Um, well, I mean, can we give a microphone? I don't know if I've got much to say. There's a couple of books on the table that I haven't seen, so congratulations, everybody. Fantastic uh, work. Um, I'm the series editor for Palgrave, the Palgrave Studies in Comics, so three of the books are from that list. So I, I you know, was part of um, soliciting the, the talent, as they say in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're, all, they're all terrific. I'm so proud of all of them. And uh, uh, the life of an academic is so difficult these days. You know, everyone's caught up with teaching and administration and all that sort of thing. For anyone to write a book at all is almost miraculous. So, and this, for books of this quality, they are, they are wonderful. Um, I would say that the publisher, the only, well, one, one of the publishing stories is that the, the key terms book, which is an alphabetical sort of listing of terms, and the publisher wanted to put an index in the, in the back. So I had, to, I, I had to fight them, you know, an index to an index. It was just absurd. So uh, that was one of my jobs on this. But, uh, but they, they are terrific. And, uh, yeah, I don't have anything to say. Thank you. Anna, do you want to add? Yeah, so as the non-comics uh, scholar in the room, um, what I would say, and I agree with Erin, that, that the work of someone like Roger began the process of bringing comics as an art form into, into the academic sphere. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is second and third generation of, of scholarship. But what's most interesting to me um, about comic scholarship is that it is a place where practitioners and scholars come together in a way that's really unprecedented in the humanities. And I think that comics scholarship more broadly is a real lesson. I mean, comics artists and comic scholars get along way better than writers and literary scholars do. Mm. I mean, you would very rarely see, um, you know, fantastically talented, creative people uh, who write novels sitting in a room with, with literary scholars. Um, it, it's, there is not a history of productive conversations about what literature is um, between those who research it and those who produce it. And comic studies really is, I think, um, at the forefront of that in terms of the humanities globally uh, in terms of demonstrating not just the benefit of things that we technically call like practice-based research or creative-based research, but actually how our understanding of culture can be enhanced when the people that have their hands on the pens uh, are in the room and shaping the way the people who are teaching and thinking critically um, about the art form, when, when those conversations really begin together. And for me, that's, that's what comic studies really shows the rest of the, the humanities is possible ways forward. I hate that term, mm -hmm. um, but in this case, I think it's appropriate. It's and I would just point. say from my tiny corner of the humanities, which is life writing studies, um, that comics has really challenged a lot as a form. Comics has really challenged a lot of what we think storytelling is and what it does. And I think that's also why we're seeing a real growth in comic studies at this moment is because we're all still aware that storytelling is important. We kind of feel it in our bones. Um, but the forms that people are using to tell stories are changing. And again, I think comic studies is really at the forefront of helping us think about multimedia practices, text image, but also the difference between comics on the screen and comics in a book. Thank you. Can I, can I add something? One last thing, and then I'd like to open it up to the room. OK, um, I don't think we made enough of this. So um, this includes three of the essays in here are done in comic book form. Yeah. Um, so a comic is used to do the academic telling. And also one of the um, entries in seeing comics through art history is also done in comics book form as well. Um, this is... Becoming more and more common 
is also a struggle when you work with a very traditional academic publisher because they don't quite understand the conventions of how to print a comic book. So this is something I think will increase and we'll get more of, um, but it's going to take a lot more negotiation between academic publishers, um, academic authors, cartoonists, as to how we take this forward in a more fruitful and easier way. So it doesn't become the same struggles again and again, and it's just seen as part of what we do. And I think that's really important. Thank you. All right. Anyone else in the room would like to get us started with questions for our editors and authors? There's a question here. Um, I have uh, two questions uh, for, uh, about the, the book, the key terms for Erin and Simon. Uh, uh, first is uh, not when uh, there were uh, different interpretation uh, uh, among the contributors, but when the two entries uh, were close to being synonymous, uh, how you uh, uh, dealt with that kind of... Uh, uh, challenge uh, because uh, did you was the choice uh, how to say uh, from entry to entry or you had uh, some uh, criteria how to uh, address that uh, problem second question is slightly more complex and it is uh, um, uh, about um, uh, when you um, when you have an entry and you uh, address etymology of the term you uh, then you start digging and then it then it becomes historical. Uh, uh, Martin Scorsese has an excellent essay about uh, uh, beginnings in the uh, in the uh, field of, of uh, cinema, and he sh uh, sh uh, showed very uh, nicely th uh, that uh, there is no border where to stop. And uh, the other problem is. Uh, uh, who is the, how to say, the author of the term or uh, the best carrier? Uh, so, uh, so. Uh, maybe two. Uh, yeah, who is the best person to write a term? Uh, we went... We went through a lot of options, and some of the terms we didn't... Some we knew immediately, oh, it has to be this person to write about this term. And other terms we didn't really know, and then we did pull resources. So we would ask friends and say, do you know anyone working on, for example, architecture and comics or something like this, right? And then, of course, sometimes we did get terms, like uh, Ian was saying where it wasn't even immediately what we would have thought would have been written, right? But we didn't want to police the writer either. So we thought, oh, wow, this is a, an interesting take on it. Maybe it isn't exactly how we would do it, but it does make reference to other things that maybe we would have forefronted in our definition. But, yeah, we really wanted, as Simon was saying before, to to let it speak to what's happening right now with the people who are writing those entries, right? So the contestation was always something we knew was going to happen and couldn't stop anyway if we tried, right? I, I contributed to the book, and I was asked to do a couple of terms, and I said, I really don't know anything about this at all. I've no idea why you're asking me, mm -hmm. but it would be a much better idea if you asked another person, and I think that's what Simon meant by this kind of co-editorship. Mm -hmm. So, And also, I, there was somebody else who I knew, and they said, oh, I've been asked to do this. I don't think I'm very good at it. Do you want to do that? So we actually were in communication, and we were exchanging and thinking, who is the best person? So in some ways, it was more like the collective was starting to make some of those decisions, I think, about what was the best way to proceed with some of the terminology. 
Yeah, and I, I think for the first question, uh, our rule, which I was just uh, uh, read aloud again, um, kind of dictated that we were going by current use. So the point of view of the book is really how specific critical terms are being used now and what they're meaning right now in comic studies discourse is. So that kind of discouraged users for, from having a more etym etymological approach where they sort of trace meaning back through time, which because that was not really the goal of the book to sort of see where these terms are coming from, partly because there are many books that do that kind of work already for many of the terms that we used. Um, and partly because when you want to pick up a book like this, it needs to be somewhat current and help us understand the present moment of, of scholarship and not so much the past, which maybe is um, better reserved for way, way, way longer entries. Yes, that's also the thing. The word counts kept it short. <laughs> so um, in addition to that, we didn't place any prohibition on the contributors and so if somebody wanted to take if they if somebody if we gave if we said can you write about this topic this idea uh, and they proceeded historically uh, that that was okay or if they proceeded theoretically that was okay if they found significance um, as the author um, in taking those approaches or a mix of those approaches um, then, then that was that was fine, and so there were occasions where, as editors, we were um, we were asking questions about the drafts that came to us. So a contributor may take a, a wholly historic approach to uh, to a term, and we'd think, ah, okay. Um, but as as readers, users, as well as editors, we'd think, but can you can you have could you have this in the book if it doesn't include such and such and such and such, which may, which may lie slightly outside or even very outside the, say, historic approach taken by a contributor, then we'd have those conversations with them. And those conversations were not fraught. They were expansive. Um, and the, one of the things that, that the, the form of the book does really or did in terms of the editorial process is that the length of the entries was a um, was a determining factor. Folks had to be very, very they had to really think um, what are the most important things to say in describing what this term means, um, and they and therefore they were self editing in a way that was really quite ruthless. Two hundred words plus, yeah, and the, and therefore those conversations, the task of editor of editorial was uh, was taken on by all of the contributors. Uh, backwards and forwards, first, first in, in terms of us putting together a list of terms, them contributing that list, then them having to editorialize their own experience as experts to write something that's only 200 words and that contains everything you need to know, uh, and then ha them handing that to us and have, us having those conversations. Yeah, does that answer your questions? Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the room? Um, earlier, there was mention of, uh, I think, specifically the Key Terms book as a unifying force, and I imagine that might be applied to all of these books in different ways. And I just wondered if there were any other projects in the pipeline or, or ideas in the mind about what other things could bring comic studies together even more and continue to unify what it sounds like was quite scattered up until recently. And, yeah, I just wondered if anyone had anything, a very general question for anybody, really. I'd like to build on that a little bit and ask what are the new frontiers then or the futures of this scholarship? So what are the f next four books that need to be written in this field? <laughs> well, let's start with one. <laughs> Worn out. Can I... I'll be really brief because I've spoken already. Um, so a, a really interesting question. And you think, oh, yeah, what needs to, what needs to get done? What needs to, what's outstanding? How are we going to kind of... Uh, from a, uh, a field point of view, not from a personal point of view. And we still have this, um, we still have this language uh, or language-based derived split in scholarship. And so the uh, so Franco-Belgian scholars, uh, Anglophone scholars, uh, Japanese, Korean and uh, Chinese scholars, um, they still have lots and lots of bridges to build, where there are structural, institutional, and cultural barriers 
that are that have allowed certain streams of overlap and and conversation between between these three area three streams of scholarship and then there are other places where the, that where scholarship that exchange doesn't happen at all and that for me is something that's that's really outstanding well how are we going to do that um, i don't know whether we're going to do it by publishing but that's the that's an issue for me Yeah, I've got one thought about it. I mean, we have a book here about graphic medicine, um, and we could say that that area is something that's grown quite rapidly in recent years. But graphic medicine is only one strand of a much broader area, which I think in key terms is defined as applied comics, um, which is comics that are not created mainly for entertainment, but they have some other function. And those comics are probably the... There are more of those comics than any other kind of comics in the world, right? And hardly studied at all. So I would say that we need to give those more attention because they are very powerful in many areas and there's very, very little written about them. So that would be my take on it. But then it would be, because I study that. So mm -hmm. it's like... <laughs> I mean, I, I want more art history. Is that... <laughs> I, mean, I, I think we only really scratched the surface, and that was why doing the um, edited collection was so valuable. Um, even for me as a kind of writer and an art historian, just thinking there's so much more that you could do with this. Um, so it's interesting that um, to hear the kind of personification of art history as the kind of old man in the chair, because it def definitely is, but I also think you can kind of make a, a chosen family from different bits of art history um, that might be more interesting or, or take different sort of characters. Um, so, yeah, I think there's... We, we were really only looking at kind of, like, Western art history. Um, so that completely can, you know, can bring a much wider range of traditions. Um, and also design history as well, I think, is what I would want to put into the mix. Yeah, on that, I think it would be... I do think it would be interesting to have more art history, but also uh, more about tactile comics, more about comics that can be approached by people with various impairments, right? Uh, also more about comics exhibitions. You know, there are so many things, I think, that are, are rich in that area. And again, like you say, also crossing, and you too, crossing the, the borders of Western art history versus other forms. It's not my field. <laughs> more life writing, more life writing <laughs> comics. Yeah. Okay. No comment, Rick? No. no. Another question from the floor. So Ben Wu on Twitter would like to know what's with the dogs. Yeah, well, Just repeating dogs for the live stream. Am I meant to speak for myself? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, ben, I'll answer your question if I can. Um, but so uh, famously, somebody once asked Fats Waller what jazz was, and he replied, uh, if you don't know, lady, I can't tell you. <laughs> However, as a scholar, I don't think that's a really satisfactory uh, answer to give. So Ben and others. Um, so the dog pyramid, uh, the dog pyramid is, um, there's two, there are two or three things going on. And uh, although I drew the image, the image belongs to us three as editors. It wasn't me going, I want a dog pyramid on the front of the book. <laughs> And Erin and Rick going, oh, all right. So that didn't happen. Uh, so so it's, it was a, it's a risky uh, and radical image uh, in lots of ways. Uh, dictionaries do not have interesting covers. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of dictionary they are, they usually don't have. Publishing doesn't rise to the challenge of having a great cover on a dictionary, right? So that's the first thing. And so we wanted to have a cover where, where, where Ben Wu would ask, what's with the dogs? <laughs> that the book would become the book with the dogs on. Uh, and that's, that's a win already. So that's so we've done, that's tick, that's good, yeah, we like that. And so then in terms of the particular image, um, it's a taxonomy image, it's an image of, of a taxonomy. Uh, different, different things from different places uh, are related uh, and unrelated in particular ways in a precarious and mutable way. It's a dog pyramid. <laughs> there's, also, there's also a... <laughs> I don't know whether, has anybody, this is right, so Ben can't answer, or he can answer on Twitter. Um, has anyone seen a dog pyramid live? No. Ah, interesting. So the dog pyramid has a, a, a history in circus. 
Um, and it, a circus is not comics, uh, but circus feeds comics, fed comics, historically fed comics. Um, and so, uh, and, and I have memories. I've seen a dog pyramid. Usually, so when the first drawing, when I first made the first drawing, these dogs had ruffs and hats as well as being piled on top of each other. But that was too circus-y, too media-specific for circuses. Um, and so the thing about a dog pyramid is it's funny. <laughs> you look at the picture and you think, wow, it's a Great Dane, and then there's a whippet on the Great Dane, and, there's, and then there's a poodle that's really pretty pink, yeah. and then there's a smaller whippet thing. Chihuahua, that's the word. <laughs> no, I don't even... It is. And also, they're standing in a country lane. So, yeah, I think that might, does, I think that might have answered the question. Erin? Uh, uh, yeah, I also, I like to think of these four dogs as being Simon, Rick, myself, and Roger. Uh, I have not yet decided which dog I want to be or which dog I think that other people would think I am. Uh, and same for the rest of you. It changes. Sometimes I think this one, sometimes I think that one. So I think that might be a, a question for all of you. You can decide which dog you think we are. And there are lots of reasons why, right? Like, it's not just, is it a pink poodle? But why is that poodle facing away? Why is he so happy and carefree? Where the chihuahua is clearly trying to steer the show, but the big dog is the one at the bottom and can walk the wrong direction, right? So, who are these people? Who are these dogs? <laughs> what other dictionary gives you the identify the editors with the dogs game? You have to say that might be one of the best sales pitches we've ever seen for... <laughs> I was just thinking, what you really need is a book about art history and comics so you can deconstruct <laughs> the iconography yeah. of the image, can't you? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. You, you mean this is our Abbey Road? Wow. Does that mean there's a premonition of, you know, there's a death, a marriage, a... Uh, my God. I think we're devolving into things we have to discuss over drinks now. But uh, before we round up, I hope you all stay for the drinks and get to know our authors and editors a bit more. I would just like to say, um, following on on Roger's point, it is indeed very difficult to be productive in academia at the moment, and not least because of the last two years as well. On top of ordinary pressures, it's been a really hard time to write, to mobilise others to write, to get anyone to meet a deadline, and to just keep on going. So I think everybody here deserves a really big round of applause for quite an impressive achievement at this time. Thank you.